He's uh, that Lambo, huh? Yeah, not Rodolfo. All right. <laughs> okay. And I have two mics. Uh, you guys want to? I was just sitting next to him when you said. Well, why don't we have you guys get up because they're going to start walking yeah. if we're not start talking. <laughs> very intimate. It is very intimate. Um, well, um, I think Rodolfo thought the panel was um, going to start a little bit later, um, but uh, we're starting earlier, in fact. Um, so maybe he'll join us. We'll see. Um, all right. Well, uh, this is a little bit more like a fireside chat then. Um, <laughs> hello, Ariana. Um, why don't we introduce ourselves briefly? My name is Lily Liu. Um, I uh, had a company called Earn.com uh, that was acquired by Coinbase sometime last year. Um, and uh, um, been you know looking a number of cool things in the space since um, and grin is one thing that captured my attention um, Ariana you want to introduce yourself sure hi Ariana Simpson uh, I run a fund called autonomous partners uh, was previously at BitGo, and I uh, do a lot of infrastructure investing uh, as well as privacy coins hence why I'm here yep um, great so uh, so, you know, first we just wanted to have a chat around, you know, what is the macro perspective on privacy coins from an investor's uh, perspective? Um, you know, obviously 2017 was an active year for this concept of the ICO. Uh, there's a lot of excitement about stable coins last year. Um, it seems like, you know, there's always sort of been this latent kind of interest in privacy coins amongst the broader community, but that's a theme that I, I, I at least see coming up more and more. Um, and so kind of what's your macro perspective on privacy coins? Why do they matter? Yeah, um, well, I think it's interesting because on the one hand, they are a category which I think does have a lot of regulatory risk, even relative to the rest of crypto, which already has a lot of regulatory risk, um, just because it's not necessarily something that a lot of governments are going to feel comfortable with. Um, on the other hand, I think that's exactly why they matter in large part, um, in the sense that, I don't know, personally, when I got into the space about, well, almost six years ago, now the idea of having private censorship free, uh, censorship resistant money was obviously one of the key principles. And so I think that it's really important that the community kind of is bringing that forward. Um, but yeah, again, I think, I think it is a category that is exposed to some risk. Um, from the investor's perspective, you know, I think the economics of different privacy coins are going to vary pretty significantly. Um, you know, the, the way Grin was designed was not necessarily the most investor friendly it's more designed to basically you know incentivize adoption and allow for later comers to really participate in the network as well without being subject to kind of like a later penalty if you will based on the inflation schedule so you know i think uh, on an individual basis different privacy coins are probably going to appeal to different communities um and so you know the last year or two um the, uh, the kind of market leaders in this space, if you want to see it that way, has been Zcash and Monero. And so how do you see Grin fitting to that space? So over and above um, sort of there being enough to go around in future generations and perhaps even sort of favoring folks who enter later? Yeah, I think it's really going to depend on what ends up getting the most real world adoption. Uh, to be honest, like, yeah, I love this space, but if you go and look at how much uh, people are actually using privacy coins, or really crypto in general, for anything. It's it's not a ton. Oh, here we go. Got it. <laughs> um, so, hey, Rodolfo. How are you? Um, good. So Flying leap on the stage. Started, started Very good. A little earlier. Welcome to the party. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, Rodolfo, if I can just, I'll introduce you just for a second. Um, Rodolfo uh, uh, is an investor at uh, Foundation Capital, is a venture capitalist, um, kind of focuses on cryptocurrency. Um, seems like you spend most of your time on crypto. Um, for a bit of time. Yes. Yeah. Um, I love how you show up with your own cookie, too. It's great. <laughs> Brought it to share. <laughs> uh, so we were just having chat around uh, privacy coins, kind of from a macro perspective, why they matter, um, you know, how uh, Grin might fit in with the incumbents, if you will, uh, Zcash and Monero, and then a bunch of the other ones um, that are, uh, you know, either waiting the wings or in production, you know, very, various different approaches. So what are your thoughts on that, Rodolfo? I love it. I think... When you think of how much governments and other, you know, centralized institutions have invested in just 
being able to analyze every little piece of data that is out there that they can trace back to a single person and just you know mine it and make money off of it and on a relative basis how little effort there's been to you know effectively counter some of that uh, and, and just give people a chance to just keep privacy for themselves um, I think this is amazing it's uh, it's it's great that we have mm -hmm. people that are dedicating time and effort to defend those values and ideals. Mm -hmm. I think it will make for a more balanced uh, <coughs> picture because right now it's just so completely lopsided. Yeah. Um, so, you know, from a um, social, you want to call it a social pers uh, perspective, there, um, I think that many of us would agree with that, that there's a need for this um, socially. But then if you think about it from your investor's standpoint, right, um, you know, one of the critiques um, of crypto from the beginning really up until now is, um, you know, how is value being created um, and who is actually being, who is actually capturing that value. Uh, and I think that, uh, at least it seems to me that for Bitcoin, um, the case for Bitcoin having value over time is, you know, more or less the surest bet you're going to, the least risky kind of bet you can take in crypto. Uh, but then for something like privacy coins, how do you see that as a, as a, as investor? So in other words, how do you see this creating value and then capturing value? Um, well, I would say if you start to look at, um, let's say, you, you can use sort of some proxies, I think, to start to think about how big privacy coins as a category could be. So, for example, you could look at offshore banking funds. So how many trillions of dollars are stored in offshore bank accounts right now? And, you know, let's say 0.5% of that gets put into privacy coins or, you know, 1%. And you can start to back into to some of the math. Um, obviously, it's all very kind of theoretical and there's a lot of unknowns. Um, but, you know, as an investor, I'm generally interested in kind of the upside case rather than, uh, you know, downside protection to some extent. And so, you know, they are very asymmetric bets because, you know, at the end of the day, Again, it's not completely out of reason to think that a small percentage of offshore banking funds, let's say, could in the next five to 10 years transition into privacy coins. And I think they're much more likely to transition into privacy coins than into even any other category of cryptocurrencies. So, um, you know, it starts to become a pretty attractive um, investment mm -hmm. category. Um, so then, how do you think about, so privacy, in my perspective, is one feature of several when it comes to money, right? When it comes to money and, you know, whether you talk, think about the money use case or the kind of world computer uh, use case. Uh, and so, you know, if you think about offshore funds, yes, they value privacy. They also value stability and the value of their, of their investment, right? If you're going to take some money and, you know, put it wherever in Panama or something like that, you care about it being private, but you also care about it being worth a million dollars today and, you know, five years from now. Um, and so, how do you think that kind of affects... Um, the adoption of you know privacy features within cryptocurrency, because is there a world really where you just take something like USDC, right? Um, basically, a cash collateralized token. Eventually, you know maybe there's a privacy layer upon some, some smart contract platform, and that's what really just wins. Basically, privacy enabled cash collateralized token. Yeah, I think that's definitely a possibility. It's a very good point about the stability. Um, I will say that you know right now that's not realistic because if you think of you know, that one in particular, for example, uh, as a layer above Ethereum, I think Ethereum's got enough to worry about without <laughs> trying to add privacy at the moment. Um, so, you know, I'm not really holding my breath on that one. Um, but no, I think I think the question is a very good one. I'm not sure I have the answer, but I think uh, I think it's definitely something to think about. Mm -hmm. So I, I think assessing the market size of privacy related mm -hmm. coins is very tricky because it depends a lot on who you ask. Mm -hmm. They will tell you, well, but that's not a valid market, or you cannot build a company on the back of that, or a legitimate company off of the back of that, just because depending on, if you ask any government that is not you know, yes. currently supporting offshore banking, then they will say like, well, that's a gray market to us. Mm -hmm. And so that's not like a good market, therefore it shouldn't be you know, analyzed. Right. And you have like different degrees of gray within mm -hmm. that or different uh, gradients. And, and so it, it makes it really tricky. Um, so it, it's almost, to my perception, a, a bit of a, a binary bet mm -hmm. um, on either you believe and you like it and you think that there's gonna be value created and you have a long enough time horizon and you size your bet appropriately and then you do it. Um, mm -hmm. Whatever the entry point might mm -hmm. be that you consider yeah. relevant. Um, I mean, I actually think that, you know, usage in dark markets is 
a good thing. I mean, <laughs> sorry, I don't know if I'm yeah. supposed to say that, but like. <laughs> Not currently um, sanctioned markets is the way to put it. Yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> I, I don't like the murder ones, but the rest, it's fine. Um, no, I mean, look, I think if you if you look uh, at the history of technology, like, most of the interesting shit comes out of, like, illegal stuff. Like, the internet, oh, it was like a haven for porn, and nothing else was ever going to come from it. You know, pr like, so much of the technology is really pushed forward by these kind of fringe use cases, so... You know, I think it's a good thing. And yeah, I mean, the point was made earlier uh, that if you want to launder money, like, guess what? People do that all the di all the time in, in much more traditional ways. So, um, you know, I think, honestly, my biggest concern for privacy coins is really, like, getting meaningful adoption. I was mentioning this earlier, like, right now, and, you know, folks are building great stuff that I think will really help with that. But it's, I think it comes down to, like, which privacy coin will win or will privacy coins win at all depending on the question like is anyone actually using them and so far the answer is eh you know but i think we'll we'll see more for sure Got it. Um, well uh in the conversations i've had one interesting sort of point that people make is that uh unless it's private or anonymous right, or shielded however you want to put it it's not actually like digital cash right uh, because there's kind of a uh, at some point once these sort of go to different addresses and these are de-anonymized through th services like chain analysis, they're actually not fully fungible coins anymore, right? Certain coins that they come from, you know, maybe uh, you know Mt. Gox for example, it's actually very different from a freshly minted uh, Bitcoin. So if you actually really want to have uh, truly functional digital cash, then privacy is actually necessary for that, right? Imagine every do every physical dollar you spend kind of had like you know the whole history of fingerprints on it. That would be uh, that would not make it cash anymore. Um, so, uh, so you know, you're excited about the category, excited about the project. Um, can you t talk a little bit more about what is it within Grin uh, that you find exciting? I like the just how scalable it seems mm -hmm. that it, it will be. Because yep. one of the, the things that terrorizes me in terms of, say, uh, cryptocurrency adoption at scale is that governments are going to start analyzing mm -hmm. everything for everyone, right? Yeah. And you're starting to see governments that are not the most democratic. Um, you know, like Venezuela is one case, right, where they're they're launching their own cryptocurrency, and you can very immediately see how that can be used uh, as a way to, you know, attack political dissidents and just snoop even more on on citizens. Mm -hmm. So I think the notion of be able to keep the state of the whole network mm -hmm. um, valid and also have it be um, scalable and lightweight is, is amazing. I like the, um, the fact that it doesn't have wallets per se, mm -hmm. so that it can enable other use cases that can be more peer-to-peer. -peer. Again, like going back to this notion of, of keeping privacy and keeping you know, things closer to the chest. Um, so those are, those are a couple of the, the ones that I really like. Uh, yeah, I'm excited about how it came about in the sense that I think it's kind of the most uh, Bitcoin-like thing uh, in terms of its genesis uh, that I've seen. And so I think that's, that's a really um, interesting model in the sense that I think it's, it's much more fair and frankly more, um, it just kind of harkens back to more of the ethos of what I imagined cryptocurrency was supposed to be um, rather than like scammy ICOs. <laughs> um, and, uh, um, and so on the flip side then, what do you see as being some of the risks? I mean, there's like a million. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, uh, where to start? Okay, so I think in, in the early days on the, on the investment side, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of risk on the kind of how do you acquire Grin, right? And the, the main way has been through these mining SPVs that a number of folks put together. Um, I think the challenge, and some folks in the room have, have run into issues with this already, is that, you know, b especially pre-launch, uh, it was very unclear, like, exactly what hash rates were gonna look like. You know, okay, you say, I'm going to invest a million dollars into this mining SPV. And the problem is you have literally zero idea, like, how many coins you're gonna get on the other side which makes it very difficult as somebody whose literal job it is to like assess risk to know whether this is a good investment or not. Um, and so, you know, kind of comes with the territory. I think people have been using a lot of, or were using a lot of different proxies and saying like, oh, well in Zcash's case, but like, I mean, really that's kind of 
questionable math um, because you know the market looks very different. There's all these unknowns. Um, so yeah, I think I think the the risks around how do you acquire Grin in the early days as an investor, um, you know, are, are numerous. But also, do you have a perspective? Yeah, we use a little bit of a framework of like what type of risk do you want to take, right? And so you can think about it in terms of technology risk, market risk, team risk, and so on. And so right now, just Grin has the whole thing, like <laughs> all of it, uh, except for it launched now, right? And to some extent, the amount of hash power that has gone into it is reducing some of the security risk, um, just in terms of protecting the chain. So it's like over time, hopefully more more of those risk elements start getting normalized, or, or mm -hmm. you know, you have a better sense for what will be the the status of the of the situation. Um, and so when you think about um, turning sort of interest into actual dollars invested in the ecosystem, um, how do you think about uh, uh, how do you think about investing and managing that risk? Um, well, I think, you know, uh, a lot of it comes down to allocating, you know, the amount that you intend to invest, perhaps over a period of time. So saying, okay, I'm willing to, you know, invest a small amount now with all of these unknowns, or maybe I'm going to wait it out entirely in the sense that, you know, like I mentioned, the inflation schedule makes it such that it, it is less uh, of a strong incentive for early investors than it might be in, in some other currencies. And so, um, or there is less incentive for people to come in and invest early. There's also the question of what is the broader crypto market doing, right? So if you think, uh, okay, there's not gonna be a lot of new investment into the space in the next, say, like six months, some of the folks who are mining may then end up having to sell at lower prices um, just to cover their, their operating costs. Um, whereas other folks may instead be willing to wait it out, kind of more of the, the VC type uh, investors. So, you know, by the way, I think that these two categories of, of thought are kind of separate from whether the technology is worthwhile or not, or even whether something is a good investment today versus in six months. And that can be a very different, different equation. Um, but I actually think that, you know, incentivizing the, the early or maybe kind of incentivizing a broader swath of folks to come into the community via the way it was designed is actually probably a good thing over time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, uh, the only thing that I would add is just uh, setting a specific size of your exposure is very, very important in crypto, um, just because you have crazy amounts of volatility, right? And so often, my suggestion to, to people is like just put whatever you're very comfortable setting on fire. Uh, and See, I've never understood that. Like, I don't like setting any money on fire. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. But I just, there's no amount of money that I'm okay setting on fire, really. Alternatively, it's, uh, it's always a good time to invest a little, never a good time to invest a lot. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> that I can get more on board with. I mean, it, like, I, I remember... Um, Especially when you're managing other people's money, the concept of just being like, ah! No, but I mean, if you, if you, if you have um, a certain diversification strategy and you want to get exposure to a certain amount, right, like you, you still are willing, I mean, at least in venture, right, like your, your portfolio is construed so that you get, I don't know, like uh, an early stage fund, a seed stage fund is probably 50, 60% loss ratio, right, like where that investment, whatever you put, is going to go to zero, right? So if you think about it in those mm -hmm. terms, like, it, you know, as long as you're aware that that's part of your model, Mm -hmm. then then that's okay. Now, how does the, the liquidity of not just Grin, but crypto assets uh, generally affect the way you think about uh, entries and exits and holding periods? Well, I think it really comes down to position sizing. And I think we've seen some egregious cases of people misunderstanding the economics of that. So you might remember kind of the Ethereum flash crash, or I think it was Polychain who dumped a giant... Uh, block of zero X and collapse the price of brought. So you see these kind of events, which would never really or very, very rarely happen in, uh, in traditional markets. Um, and so I think you really just have to consider like, okay, what is the circulating supply? What does 24 hour uh, volume look like? And think about, you know, what is actually going to move the market? Obviously, if you're trading OTC, it's a little bit of a different calculus. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's a big piece of it. A lot of it depends on your strategy, honestly. Like, I think part of what made the uh, ICO boom so appealing to a set of investors was that you had very defined entry points 
that were very similar to mm -hmm. what you would find in a you know, uh, technology company, seed mm -hmm. investment or, or a series A or a series B, where you have a certain amount of something that it's getting sold and you have a you know, timeline to invest or not invest, and then that's it. Um, so that, the, that looks similar to what a mm -hmm. VC would normally do. Yeah. Right? Um, I think for, for then liquidity, it just changes the game completely, right? Because you don't have necessarily some of those um, specific times where you can invest or not invest. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, you have to justify your entry strategy in your holding period and the management of that position in a very different way. Mm -hmm. I think like another thing that has been new to the market in the recent couple of years uh, has been the ability to do short. Uh, positions, right? Like where that mm -hmm. was not that easy to to do, and even then, it's still hard uh, given the liquidity constraints in a bunch of the uh, of the markets. Yeah. That also creates a lot more complexity for for institutions that are either playing long only or that cannot be trading in and out of uh, mm -hmm. positions for other reasons. Um, so you know, now that you have essentially infinite entry and infinite exit points, um. You know, what are the metrics that you would like to see that would compel you to enter the market? I mean, I think, I don't know, my approach is kind of a combination of looking at actual numerical data points and the community. Um, you know, I think obviously Ethereum is in a, a tough spot now, but uh, just in terms of scalability and so forth. But I think uh, what got me really excited about it back in the day was just the level of developer enthusiasm around the project. Um, and I think that's kind of hard to quantify. Obviously, if you go to some of the, the hackathons and things like that, seeing what people are building uh, is probably a good proxy for that. So um, I think, yeah, just continuing to see and including a lot of the folks in the room, um, you know, what people are building. And I think given, you know, how recently Grin launched, the level of interest and enthusiasm on both the investor and the developer side has been great. Um, so just, I think, you know, a lot more of that would definitely be part of it. Um, in a way, some of these metrics are going to be harder to see because, after all... <laughs> yeah. Well, you can see developers in the room. You can't necessarily see a lot That's else. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's like the, the teams, right? That, uh -huh. um, you know, coming at it from a uh, VC investor perspective, um, it, it has to be high-quality teams building stuff related to this, right? Um, that's the filter that we've been using for mm -hmm. uh, the projects that we've invested in the space. Go, Catherine. <laughs> um, uh -huh. And, and it, it's going to be something similar. Uh, I think it's going to be important to have a point of view on whether you believe that the value will accrue to the tokens or to companies, mm -hmm. uh, to the equity of companies building on top of the protocol yep. or using the protocol. Yep. Um, that, to me, is still TBD. Um, that is, a, that is a, a very salient open question, right? That, that kind of plagues crypto all along. Do you have, do you have thoughts on that? Uh, when it has come to ICO-related projects, yep. we try to have exposure to both the equity and the tokens mm -hmm. because we don't necessarily have a strong opinion uh, either okay. way. It's Got too it. early to tell. Okay. Um, and so. You know, when we can, we will try and, and get that hedge uh, mm -hmm. exposure because also we feel that that way we're aligned with the uh, with the mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, uh, uh, right? That you don't want to you don't want to be holding you don't want to be long equity if they have liquidity on their tokens and they dump the tokens huh. uh, already, right? Fair. And and so and, and similar the other way around. So Fair. you want to be aligned as long as you believe in the in the project. So I don't really buy fat protocols. Um, I think it is going to depend on the category. So I think in monetary use cases, including something like Grin, um, then you would actually see value accrued to the token or coin itself. Um, I think in like more infrastructure uh, type things, uh, I, I just have a hard time seeing all the value being captured at the bottom. That seems like a really dramatic reversal from what we've seen in like the rest of technology. Um, so I think. My position is that value is going to be a little bit more evenly distributed than it has been, but uh, I still think it's going to be fairly concentrated towards the top. Uh, but again, that's very different from things like Bitcoin or, you know, I think privacy coins as a category. Um, and how much room do you think there is uh, for, you know, in long-term equilibrium for different players for, let's say, the monetary use case, right? 
Um, there's Bitcoin, which is pretty well established. Um, it's kind of got its corner of digital gold store value fairly well defined, and enough people have bought into that. Um, and so, you know, when I first got into this, there was a lot of this sort of explaining why Bitcoin is important, talking about, well, you know, we have 220 odd currencies, give or take, today, and that's kind of insane, right? But if you look at crypto, it's like over 2,000 right now. Now, obviously, a lot of that's uh, probably going to the grave, but, um, but uh, you know, outside of Bitcoin, how much room is there and should there be? I think we'll have a world of like millions of tokens uh, because I think eventually there'll be security tokens and all this stuff. Um, I think a lot of the infrastructure tokens will actually be abstracted away. So they will perhaps exist, but like you will never really touch them or own them. Um, they'll be kind of handled machine to machine. Um, and then I think that in the money category, um, I think there will be more than one winner, but probably not more than you know five that are actually meaningful. Because think about it, like money, I think it becomes more interesting and more appealing the more people have it. It's not yeah. something like, oh, I have this you know private personal Ariana coin and like nobody else wants it. Like yeah. this is fucking yeah, useless, right? right? right. So uh, I think in in money you'll actually see things be much more concentrated. Um, whereas in utility tokens or things like that, it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you've even seen that with seen that with the U.S. dollar. Zimbabwe, right, took on the U.S. dollar. Uh, was it El Salvador? Um, so some of these smaller countries, mm -hmm. um, and arguably more of them would if kind of you know uh, banking relationships you know had different features. So, um, so very diplomatic <laughs> way of putting it. <laughs> uh, but I mean, they it's I mean geography matters, right? Like because mm -hmm. money gets largely spent within uh, you know geographical constraint. Mm -hmm. Right, that oh, and lives under a Zimbabwe certain regulation. Zimbabwe is pretty darn far away, right? No, but I mean, those yeah. all of those countries that are giving up their own mm -hmm. currency is because they don't have any choice, right? Because all of the mismanagement of their monetary policy mm -hmm. and the lack of, you know, right. hard currency right. anymore to have reserves. Uh, so I on. take your point. Geographical adjacency potentially also. So those that are in, but they, I mean, we like literally money. ship them dollars. It's crazy, by the way. In Zimbabwe, when I was I was there in 2013, which is how I kind of got into the space, but that's a story for another time. But the interesting thing is the dollar bills were literally the shittiest dollar bills you've ever seen. I was like, what is this? Oh, look, it's a dollar bill. I mean, literally completely <laughs> overused. It was it was shocking. Um, so yeah, just an aside. I, I was just in Venezuela a couple of months ago, and it was it was really fascinating because it's the same the same story. Like if you bring a fifty dollar bill and it's, it just has a little bit of a of a wrinkle, people won't take it because like mm. it it won't be accepted locally, even though you know it's uh, yeah. Right. Oh wait, that's the opposite. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so you like bring your ironing board, I suppose. Um, uh, um, by the way, the petrol was not <laughs> being accepted anywhere. Uh, in the the it's a joke. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so just um, you know, one last question. You know, from a uh, uh, perspective of investor, how do you allocate in your crypto portfolio to privacy, um, amongst all of the other stuff out there? Um, so there's, it, it, it's weird. I go back and forth, so mm -hmm. therefore I have a little bit of everything, mm -hmm. um, because one part of me says. Privacy will be a winner-take-all uh, market, mm -hmm. potentially, because you just want to be hiding yourself in the biggest crowd. But then at the same time, I just see different implementations and different technologies having different trade-offs. And I believe that some are going to accrue more value than others, mm -hmm. but I don't know which ones just yet. And so at least on the personal side, I just buy a bit of everything. Got it. Okay. Um, and you so can because it's always liquid, right? Yeah. More uh, or less. Yeah. It's. I have to think about it differently from from venture, where in venture you lead a round, and you cannot sell that equity for the next ten years uh, because that's just shitty, and you just can't. Yeah. Right. In this case, you know, you can just buy in and out, or you can mm -hmm. rebalance your position, and you can just be more um, mm -hmm. quantitative about it if you want. Yeah. Um, um, so privacy is about a third of my portfolio generally, so pretty much fairly concentrated because there's like three that are worth owning in my humble opinion, um, including Grin. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I think, you know, it's again, it's it's a fairly high risk category in some ways, but I do think that it's uh, definitely the kind of thing that could 
really move the needle, and so that's something obviously I'm looking for as an investor. Um, great. Uh, well, um, I don't want to overstep our time, um, but uh, do we have time for questions? Yeah. Well, if we could take one or two questions. Um, yes, sir. Okay, so if I can repeat the question, uh, gentleman's question is what's going to drive your investment in GRIN? Uh, is it overall market conditions or sort of infrastructure development and progress within the project itself? Is that fair? Okay. Um, a mix uh, of both. Um, because the thing is you have to evaluate uh, everything, right? Um, more than anything, like what it's the, at what level of adoption do you feel comfortable with the staying power of the coin, and then what is the right enterprise? And so that's where you have to think of Bitcoin and other uh, asset prices on a relative basis. But I guess a lot of it de will depend on your horizon, right? And your uh, desire for liquidity. I don't have anything super interesting to add, so I'll just say nothing. <laughs> Thank you. OK, um, I think we're a wrap. Thank you. Thank you, Rodolfo. Thank you, Ariana. Thank you, guys. Okay, 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 before everybody goes. All right, um, so I wanna say thank you for our last uh, panelists. Give them a round of applause, thank you.